Uh, I just returned from Egypt a few weeks ago, and uh, many of the tour guides are still saying that. They're saying that they were built to worship uh, the gods of light, the gods of dark, um, the gods of war. Well, you know, the only people that really say that are uh, the tour guides and some of the history books, because the Egyptians themselves and the temple walls and the mystery schools give us a much different story. And what they say is this. I'm going to use this particular temple uh, to begin an example. Uh, this is the, the temple of, of Karnak. Just outside of the Karnak complex, there is a, a small temple that's, that's generally closed to the public, dedicated to the uh, body of a woman and the head of a lioness, whose name is Sekhmet, Sekhmet, S-E-K-M-E-T. Now, traditional uh, Egyptian history says that Sekhmet was the goddess of war. And wherever you would see the goddess of war, Sekhmet, you would see uh, uh, individuals praying for a good war or praying not to have war or, or something surrounding uh, uh, the act of war. What the mystery schools say and what the temple walls themselves say is that this wasn't a temple built to worship anyone, that these chambers were built and dedicated to some aspect. They isolated some aspect of the human psyche, some aspect of the human personality, and the initiates had the opportunity to immerse themselves in this temple for some period of time to master that aspect of their lives. So, for example, Sekhmet, not the goddess of war, Sekhmet was dedicated to the warrior that lives within every human who has ever lived. The warrior within you. You know that warrior very well. You know how to use that warrior. Do you know when that warrior is appropriate? Your relationships will teach you the mastery as you have the wisdom to allow and recognize that appropriateness. The, 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 uh, uh, the warrior within, the temple of Sekhmet, uh, the temple of Isis in the island of Philae. This is a beautiful temple uh, dedicated to two different aspects within the individual. Uh, the aspect of fidelity, uh, which has many different meanings in many cultures. Fidelity to oneself. Fidelity to the truth of one's path in life. That, that was one aspect of the temple of Isis. And the love that comes from that fidelity. Conjugal fidelity. The fidelity to commitments made to another in conjugal agreements. Uh, beautiful temple complex, very well restored. We uh, just recently returned from, from this particular temple. Um, the temples of Hathor. This is interesting. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this. Um, throughout Egypt, until recently, whenever you would see Hathor represented on a temple, you would see it like this. The face would be smoothed off and erased and taken away. When the Coptic Christians came through this part of the world centuries ago, um, they didn't like what Hathor was representing in their belief system. They chose not to destroy the temple, simply to wipe the faces away. And you'll see this throughout Egypt. Uh, you can see the, the faces are simply chiseled off of the temple walls and the columns. Well, until recently, we really didn't know what this Hathor looked like because all the temples had been defaced. Uh, 1986, 87, I was in Egypt and uh, happened to be there during a time when they were excavating, the uh, authorities were excavating to build a military bunker. And uh, as happened so often, they dug into the ground to build this bunker and they found uh, a temple complex that had been lost in the, the history and the memory uh, of the Nile floods that covered it in mud every year. And it was a small temple, a small chapel dedicated to Hathor. Uh, and it was the first time we ever really had a good view of what Hathor looked like. So I'd like to share that with you. This is our, um, our Egyptian guard that is letting us pass through this highly technical and very secured area, uh, this fence right here. Down into the enclosure, I'll orient you, this is ground level right here. So we're down ground level. And what you're seeing, these are the tops of the columns of the Hathor temple, and the floor is still 30 feet below the ground level. So they haven't excavated down. We're standing at the tops of, of the columns. Uh, and I just returned a few weeks ago from this very site, and they have not done any more excavation. They're, they are not in any big hurry to excavate this site. So this is what Hathor looks like. You notice the, the beautifully uh, delicate features uh, of the, the lips, the eyes, the ears. Absolutely beautiful image. Hathor represented love, the love of oneself, the joy in the love of life. The reason I place these images here for you now 
is because it's interesting, no matter what temple you go to in Egypt, whether it's the temple of rage, uh, the temple of the warrior within, the temple of light, the temple of darkness, uh, the temples of lust, a uh, great temple to be stuck in for 30 years or so, whatever temple you go into, you will find the image of Hathor, the image of love, outside of those temples because it is in love that we are asked to know ourselves in rage. In love, we are asked to know our, the hate within in the past. We are asked to know of the light and the dark and uh, uh, the jealousy and the lust. In love, we are ask, asking ourselves to have the experience of life. And the Hathor, the energy, the patterns of Hathor at each of those temples to remind us of that. Uh, the temples of experience. The initiates thousands of years ago had the luxury of going into a temple and isolating some aspect of their experience and staying in that temple until they had mastered that emotion. Staying in that temple for days or weeks or perhaps an entire lifetime. Maybe they were stuck in a, a particular temple, uh, the, temple of, um, the temple of love and the temple of what love and relationships are all about. Uh, as they progressed and moved forward through these temples, they would move on to the temples of knowledge and the temples of wisdom prior to their final initiations. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you now is because you and I no longer have the luxury of moving into a temple and isolating some aspect of emotion for years or for a lifetime. We live those temples every day in our lives through our relationships. Relationships are the temples that are allowing us to know ourselves in all ways, to know of the, the warrior within, to know of our anger and our rage and our joy and our ecstasy. The temples do not have to be painful. Uh, and as we redefine pain and fear in our lives, what we find is they are all opportunities. They are opportunities to know ourselves. The temples of knowledge. This is one of the most uh, amazing temples in the Abydos Temple complex. Um, the temple of Seti I, just behind and below this temple now, is uh, we're seeing a site that is now being dated at over 22,000 years old. They're dating this, uh, it's empirical evidence, from the, the layers of Nile flooding, the times that the river has, uh, has flooded and receded. They've counted at least 22,000 layers covering this temple site. Well, this particular temple, um, probably one of the oldest in Egypt, is also one of the most amazing. When I was there in 1986, they, uh, we see this grass growing. This is a marsh in a swampy area. And uh, what they did was they put this rickety little uh, bridge down here for us so that we could walk across the water and examine the inside of these, of these solid uh, granite walls. And uh, I'm going to go back a slide and point something out to you. Look at the, how these walls are constructed. Look at this tongue and groove construction of these massive granite blocks weighing 60 and 80 tons apiece. This is unique architecture, not to Egypt uh, alone. We don't see this anywhere else in the world in modern times. And we, uh, we know that these now, or we're suspecting, these are at least 22,000 years old. Well, as we go down into these temple walls, we find even more of a mystery, perhaps. As you begin to see very specific patterns, geometric patterns, very non-Egyptian, upon these walls, the mystery itself comes from how these were even produced. They're not painted. They're not etched. They are literally flash burned with a rapid, intense heat onto solid granite high quartz walls thousands of years ago. Uh, the only technology we have today that would even approach that would be a laser, and a laser probably would not do it because a laser would be so heat or so hot, excuse me, that it would melt the quartz crystals in the granite. And this quartz isn't melted; it's simply scorched. So there's a mystery as to how this pattern uh, has even come about. Well, this pattern of 19 interlocking circles in the science of sacred geometry uh, is now known as the flower of life. It is referenced in uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth that we spoke of earlier, uh, in the texts that were over 13,000 years old. So it wouldn't surprise me if this temple may be over 22,000 years old. Um, historians don't like those numbers. Uh, geologists have no problem with those numbers at all. So it's interesting to see how, how these dating, uh, the dating methods and how the history and the sequence is unfolding. Well, this particular pattern 
is literally a two-dimensional informational system that was left to us through the temples of wisdom. And what may be said about this particular temple is that all that may be known, not experienced, not felt, not emoted, all that may be known in terms of our mathematical world uh, is embodied within the geometric patterns that we see here. In case you couldn't see that well, uh, I've put this schematic here for you. What you're seeing are a series of, uh, of curves, interlocking curves, uh, like the CBSI, looking like this. Those interlocking curves in the sci science of sacred geometry represent what is called the Vesica Pisces. And what we're saying about the Vesica Pisces is that each of those curves represents uh, um, a male and a female energy in the old terms, in the new terms, we call this uh, electrical and magnetic information in the 20th century idiom. Uh, it's the science of the union of opposites. And in the science of sacred geometry, what we say in the flower of life it was within the inner and the outer walls, these two concentric circles of this pattern, these two concentric circles represent metaphorically the inner and the outer wall of the female egg, the female ovum. And what we say is that within those two circles represent all possibilities as potential. Anything can happen through the union of opposites and, uh, and the way that those unions are allowed, electrical and magnetic energy. This is the temple of wisdom, one of the temples of wisdom that we have in Egypt. Uh, as the initiates would move through their lives mastering emotion, the temples of knowledge then would be meaningful to them, just like it is in our lives today. Without the context, without knowing what our lives mean to us, the knowledge is meaningless to us. We would move from the temples of emotion and the temples of knowledge then to the temples of wisdom. Uh, this image that you're seeing, uh, the temple of the Sphinx, the temple of, of the wisdom. This is where the ancient texts uh, tell us that the Hall of Records is actually maintained the records of human history that resulted from the living of the knowledge, from the wisdom of the knowledge of our cycle from this time back to the last shift of the ages. This is the temple that Edgar Cayce references time and time again. Uh, it's interesting, again, I was just uh, at, uh, in Egypt within the last few weeks. Three doorways now, three passageways have been found that lead into hallways, stairways, and sealed stone and wooden doors that are leading to a, a, some chamber inside of this temple um, probably in 1996 as they're estimating now that these doorways will be open so it'll be interesting to see how uh, how that comes about so the uh, the temples of um, of wisdom you and I live these temples we're living the identical process to the initiates of old in our lives today you and I do not have the luxury of going to a temple to isolate, going to a stone building to isolate these aspects of our lives. Our temples have, in fact, become our temples of relationship. This is the way the wisdom comes to us. Now, I've, I've given you a schematic here uh, uh, as an illustration of, uh, of the way the processes are coming to us. To the degree that you and I view the events in our lives purely through the logic of the mind, through the left and the right brain, the polarity of the mind, you and I always will live in that polarity. That's what locks us into the polarity. That's what locks us into the separation. And there's nothing wrong with that. So please not hear me say that it is wrong. It is a choice to remain locked into that polarity. And the ancients tell us that logic is very important. The logical mind is a key portion, plays a key role in our experience. And they also say that it goes even farther than that. Uh, what they say is that in addition to the logic of the mind, that it is the wisdom of the heart, the wisdom of the heart that tempers the logic of the mind. These concentric circles centering around the heart, the seven-layer liquid crystal uh, oscillator that we call the heart. Uh, it's also interesting that in our language, we have no word to describe a wisdom that comes from the heart. I, I have to go to another culture. Uh, part of my heritage is, 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 heritage is Cherokee. And in the Cherokee traditions, there is a word, 